here. And I have a kind of neat audio recording, I think there might be video with this too, of the, uh, of the beginning of this episode. I don't know why they have a 40 second intro. Is, that is Forbes, like Forbes magazine. Why is he urging people to buy? Yes? Prices are very low, so any time that anybody is in a super low stock market, it's going to feel that return on investment. So you're going to go with altruism, that he's really trying to give people good advice. That might be true. That might be true. Does anyone have a more cynical reaction? Tyler? Like trying to save himself and have people pump money into him? Yeah, he just bought a ton of stock. Now, what was happening on the trading floor? The crash began on Thursday. And on Friday, the vice president of the exchange, backed by all the investment bankers, walked up to the middle of the exchange and began buying stock after stock after stock at ridiculously above market prices. The bankers were desperate to stop the panic by buying. It was critical for the bankers, who were going to lose everything, to try to prop this market back up. Now, it might be true that Forbes is our buddy here. I don't know him that well, so I really can't say whether he was being altruistic or not. But I think at least we can take a cynical approach and ask, what else might he have been trying to get out of it? Maybe he was trying to get his return on investment back. I think that's at least a plausible story, and it was something that the banks were actively doing, and they were marketing hard to try to restore confidence. It took a very long time. I don't know if any of you know people from this era, but I mean, my grandfather ended up buying some stock in 1947, but I don't think he bought a single share of stock until 1947. Yes? Well, I don't know how like, Mr. Forbes would even know what he's buying, whether it's good or not, because he doesn't know whether the company's going to go bankrupt the next day. That's right. He doesn't have any idea if they're going to be able to get credit. And that's, that's part of it, too, is a lot of the, I mean, you might think, well, I don't know, Remington. Big American company, been around for a while, managed to get through. Everyone needs bullets, you might say. We have to go turkey hunting, whatever you do with your Remington bullets. Well, how do you know that Remington is going to be able to get a loan to pay, you know, or, or, or on the other hand, maybe they're going to go into receivership the next day, and that stock is also going to go to zero. Lots of companies were wiped out. Now, part of what Fama is talking about or was talking about was in this era, people were investing based mostly on gut instinct and not on science, and not on data. In part, the data was hard to get. I mean, you did have these disclosure regimes, which come up in the, in the act, and you could read these reports, but they didn't have computers. So it was very hard to do the math to even figure out what something was worth based on any kind of mathematical approach. 
I mean, let's give Fama a little credit for that, right? That he was coming into an era where there was very little science in uh, finance. It's important to say finance when talking about these things. And he was in, 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 injecting that, uh, that science to it. But how does Forbes know what he's buying is any good? Well, probably that he talked to the, he, he's the kind of person who could pick up the phone and talk to the CEO, but they lie to him. I mean, yeah, and then what? Yeah, Tanya. This is going to sound like a stupid question, but like we know what caused the crash in 2008. It was like overpopulation, all of this stuff all the worst. What caused this? Like I was mentioning, there are like entire books on the subject, and they all say various things. Uh, the allegation at the time was speculation that people were, uh, were investing in stocks and didn't understand it, and we needed to curtail the amount of companies, and we needed to vet them and have more um, policing over who invests and how. And we began on a road of classifying people as sophisticated investors, and we weren't going to worry about them, and the rest of you, everyone in this room, would be classified as an unsophisticated investor. right? You don't have a million dollars, and that's the measure of sophistication today. And so you're not entitled to invest in what they deem risky asset classes because of this theory at the time, this, this pervasive thinking that it was caused because ordinary people had overinvested in speculative companies that were no good. Whether that was true or not is up to some debate. I mean, it could have been at the time, I believe there was issues going on in uh, bank loans, it could have been other credit issues. Um, you know, I mentioned that things were really bad in Germany. I don't have the whole history of Europe, but you know, other tensions in Europe, and London at that time was the real center of of world finance, so I, I don't know the, the interpolation between you know the London markets and the New York markets, but other thoughts? I, I don't I don't I mean I certainly don't have the answer. Well, I think this gets to John's point from earlier, and, and maybe this will be illustrated more visibly in something called the flash crash, which I have a quick video to show you on that as well. But when people, st so there were, one of the aspects that certainly, I don't know what started the crisis, and I don't know that anybody really does, but I can tell you that what made the crisis as bad as it was is people did panic, and they began to sell urgently, which drove down the price, causing more people to be anxious, who sold even more urgently. And then they were running to the, and these were bank stocks. They're running to the bank to get their money out of the bank. And the banks, of course, don't have all that cash on hand. They've lent 90% of it out. Plus, they don't keep it in their vaults. So they only have 10% of their cash on hand. 50% of people are demanding it. When you get to your bank and they say, I'm sorry, we don't have any more cash today, people are rioting and they're tearing, they're literally tearing the bank buildings apart. There's panic in the streets. People are shooting themselves. People are jumping out of windows. People are screaming, crying in desperation. Talk about a, you know, exuberance. That perpetuated and drove that downward spiral. Yeah. And actually, for like the last 15 to 20 years, the, the agricultural heartland was just totally like just dust. You mean previous that, because of the dust bowl, the yeah. whole, yeah. If you read the grapes, so, so there, I'm sure there's part of that too. Right, that was directly prior to this, and maybe that, and you know what, I hadn't thought, I had never put this together, but I wonder if that Dust Bowl issue is why it was Kansas uh, yeah. that started on the track of securities uh, regulation in 1911. So I'd say almost like every commodity was virtually like Yeah, yeah, and people were invested in futures, and maybe they were speculating in pork bellies and corn and wheat and all those other good things that you know you expect to have produced, and they just, those crops didn't come up. So I, I would imagine that the Dust Bowl and that whole Steinbeckian, you know, dystopia that was going on was a, was a factor as well. But I think, I don't know that, and again, I, I could look at, see if there's some better books. I'm not the authority on this one, but I can tell you that once the crash began, panic gripped America, and people desperately put in sell orders for everything and tried to just hoard cash, and they kept that mentality. I mean, my grandfather's family took everything they had and put it under the bed, right? I think a lot of people did that because they didn't trust anything anymore. I mean, yeah, trust was... Uh, also, at, at what point did we go off the gold standard? That wasn't until Nixon, was it? No. Okay. Is it that late? There might have been some role in that. And maybe, maybe England went off the gold standard around this time, allowing more currency fluctuations.
That, I, that is a story I haven't heard. That's interesting. And all those ships stopped and you had to go out the gold standard. Is that why we went to... I worked with those and you stopped it. Because you weren't allowed to stop it. That's why we went to the gold standard. Well, I can tell you more about the effects. Let me tell you what the effect of this was, which was that the political climate of America changed. And what we moved several degrees to the left. And by the way, this was not in a vacuum. At the same time, we have the Bolshevik Revolution, right, uh, which was a communist revolution. We also have the rise of socialism and anarchism in Spain and in Italy, obviously the National Socialist Party in Germany, uh, which was not really on the left, but at least you know had some elements of that in their insanity. Uh, but there's this huge pressure from the world community to move to the left, and then industry collapses. So a man, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who ran on a campaign of a very orthodox, I'm going to balance the budget, you know, I'm going to uh, not spend into a deficit, changed his tune completely and was influenced very heavily by a economist, John Maynard Keynes. And Keynes basically rewrote classical economic theory and said that actually uh, we need to understand the government's role differently, that for centuries before, beginning with Adam Smith, who, by the way, is fairly misunderstood, but he did say that the government should basically take a hands-off role because the market will sort things out, basically. Whereas Keynes said, no, the government has a fundamentally critical role to play in making sure markets function properly, and they can do that by spending money. That's a big reason why the federal government had to raise taxes. They also vastly increased their spending and vastly increased the ambit of the federal government. The central government grew three, five, ten times the size that it had been before in what amounts to a blink of an eye in American history. And as a result, we started to get some of the laws uh, that, uh, that we now deal with today in securities which were a huge expansion of the federal government's perceived role. And this was popular at the time. I mean, the people very much wanted strict regulations of all sorts of aspects of the economy. And so you have not just the uh, uh, securities laws, but as I mentioned, like the Fair Labor Standards Act, which created a you know, minimum number of, a maximum number of hours that could be worked without overtime and, and a number of other aspects as well created the right to unionize, right? That changed American labor. This is all happening at a, at a, at a period of time. Uh, meanwhile, Europe is falling into, into war. You know, Germany is not meeting their reparations, is militarizing. So a very, very chaotic time. And the laws that we have today come out of that time. And I really try to emphasize that for students who may not be aware of the history because I feel that so much of the legislative history and the motivation and the interpretation of the Securities Act came from this zeitgeist, this fear, this panic, this concerns about socialism, this move to the left in order to prevent moving even farther. I mean, this was a crazy time. And I think since then, you know, there have been movements back and forth, but there certainly have been other uh, uh, crashes as well. Um, just a couple other things to mention, uh, and then I'll just talk briefly in the minute or two I have about the other uh, crashes is that um, uh, despite all of this new regulation, the states continue to have their own regulation as well. And this was a major problem for a lot of industries. So the overall preemption uh, occurred with the National Securities Markets Improvement Act of 1996. And the NSMIA, the National Securities Markets Improvement Act of 96, said that uh, securities that are sold on a public exchange or, in my world, through a private placement, usually Reg D exemption, are exempt and preempted from state law. So now you had some real value add. If you could get on the New York Stock Exchange or, for that matter, in the Philadelphia Stock Exchange, you no longer had to comply with Kansas's 1911 security statute, which was a huge improvement for corporations because it simplified the regulations. And of course, it didn't solve all of our problems. We had the dot-com crash uh, of 2002, which uh, you can see here was pretty, was pretty dramatic. But what was interesting about this crash is I want to, I want to point out here how, um, how peaky 
that chart is. I mean, when we see the charts, I'll just go, I'll just scroll back for a second here. This is a very different looking chart. We see a gradual increase in the stock market. There's clearly, you know, a fair bit of uh, uh, kind of peaking around here. But, um, you know, we're looking at values that have been persistent for a little while. Whereas we're looking at um, a overall increase in the NASDAQ, which is where these tech stocks were going from about 1,500 points to 5,000 points over a very short period of time. And actually, what's interesting is the crash looks to me like you could just draw a line straight through here. You know, the, even after the crash, you kind of get a correction. I mean, this is not, we, we didn't go to zero. And this was a particular type of stock. It was mostly tech stocks. And just like now, like you change the name of a company, it's a Long Island blockchain company, the stock price goes up. I mean, some of you, some of us may remember it who, who were there for it, but anything with .com, pets.com, dogs.com, uber.com, this.com, that.com, all of it was going public at alarming rates and everyone was buying it because they all wanted in on the action. And it's like um, musical chairs, right? I mean, everyone's trying to get in before the music stops. I think there was some awareness at the time that it was, it was kind of crazy. Uh, all right, one last video. And then I'll just cap, recap. Because you mentioned, I wanted to show you one more crash. This was called the flash crash. And you'll see why in a second. At the, what's neat about this one is you can see this one in real time of how quickly things can fall apart. E one X Q S Z nine nine underscore four. Is that a one? Is that an L? Is that a little L? Hmm. Once again, I believe you're the big one. So all the red are sell orders. And what you're seeing is people are panicking. And as the price is going down, yeah, some people are buying because they think it's going to pop back up. But as it goes down, people tend to sell more and more and more. This is sort of a visual representation in much faster modern real time of what was happening on Wall Street in 1929. This is a crash. And this wasn't even necessarily driven by an algorithm, but, but now we have those aspects as well. I mean, it, it's, the guy is freaking out, right? I mean, you're right, he's gonna have, a, he's literally, this guy's gonna have a heart attack, right? I mean, no one, I, I don't know, does that have closed captioning? Yeah. And it just keeps going down. Um, I don't know the causes of, of this one. Again, like once it starts happening, it takes on a life of itself. If you turn on, just think about it from this perspective. You turn on the television. You have ten thousand dollars of stock in the market. How do you feel? What do you do? Nothing? Turn off the TV? Buy? Yeah. There's in the, these that, that is true. That is true and that's a problem called illiquidity if there's just no one left to buy. But in these markets there's usually someone to buy at some price. Because those stocks aren't going aren't necessarily going to zero. Going to zero means nobody wants to buy it at all. But, you know, we didn't get that far down. We had a, it was a long way to fall. So, and by the way, the other thing is the New York Stock Exchange now has a policy that if the stock falls too much, too quickly, they will shut down the markets. They will actually, so no one can buy or sell. They will, 
Yeah. yeah. They basically pull the plug on the whole damn thing, and it just shuts down and say, everyone, chill the F out. <laughs> Take a chill pill. Have a scotch. Come back tomorrow. All right? We'll talk, and we'll talk this thing through. Which is one of the fail-safes that we have built into a system prone to what Richard Thaler would call irrational exuberance. All right, so to sum up, we talked about the efficient market hypothesis, which Eugene Fama takes a strong approach to, but you know, a lot of people have contested, and some people even blame as the theoretical basis for the 2007 crash, uh, too much belief in this uh, uh, math of the stock market. The history of the stock exchange is interesting. It started with a massive antitrust violation uh, in a different era when that wasn't illegal, and uh, as a result of technology and, and other elements, we did have quite a lot of consolidation uh, in, this, in this industry, which leads us to the crash of 1929, where uh, amidst a patchwork of spotty and ineffective state regulation, we have a lot of people who are invested more than they can afford, who are invested with borrowed money, who uh, are invested in banks that are invested in banks that are invested in banks, and the whole thing unravels in a way that throws or is the result of the world being thrown into an utter tailspin. Uh, one way that we tried to prevent that from happening again was the Securities Act of 1933, which we'll talk more about when we reconvene next week, as well as the Exchange Act of 1934, which we'll talk about Rule 10b-5 in two weeks, or you'll talk about with Professor Echeverry. And we'll briefly also mention the Sarbanes-Oxley Act of 2002, which has been a very expensive regulation, which has actually encouraged a lot of companies not to go public or to even go private. So with that, uh, have a great rest of your week. I will see you next Wednesday, and we're going to come back and talk about going public and staying private. So I will see you then.